it's really a pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Virginia Tankun. Uh, she's <laughs> she's a professor in the Concordia University in, mm. in Montreal. Uh, she had really a long trajectory uh, in, in all these uh, studies on uh, motor learning skills. So she started doing the PhD thesis with Michael Petride. Then she moved to all these studies on uh, motor skills. She's really super well known on studies on musicians, on uh, you know, plastic brain changes with uh, learning music, also studies with reading perception, reading production, etc. And in, in these uh, recent years, uh, she has really a super interesting uh, research line on groove and also uh, all the idea of music or of pleasure with rhythm. So, um, so I can go a little fast, okay? I'm very really sure that you will do very much. We only have one limitation. So first of all, or two limitations. One is the sound. The other one is that we have to finish at one o'clock exactly. Okay, so that. Yeah, but thank you. I'm going to talk really fast. <laughs> so thank you so much, Joseph, for uh, inviting me here today. It's such a pleasure to be back in Barcelona. The last time I was here, I was here for five days right before the pandemic hit and had to go back. So now uh, I'm back and uh, working on projects with uh, Josep and with uh, Anthony uh, Rodriguez Fornells at uh, Vedice. So I'm super happy. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some studies that we've done on musical groove. And I'm also going to add in a section on dance because uh, it's kind of fun. Um, I will say for those of you in the audience who aren't completely bilingual, si quieren al final preguntar en castellano, no me es ningún problema, pero una desgracia, pero en catalán, you no know, puedo. <laughs> <laughs> but I love Catalan and slowly I'm going to learn. So, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about groove and why music makes us want to move. And hope if we were more lucky, we would be listening to uh, a Brazilian drumming group that one of my students was participating in. And you would see me dancing around and illustrating to you uh, the fact that hearing this kind of music really makes us want to move our bodies. So why does listening to uh, a musical rhythm make us want to move? We can imagine or we know a lot about the fact that it gives us pleasure, uh, et cetera, but why specifically does it make us want to move? And that's something that we're really uh, curious about. So one of the reasons that we think, and, and a lot of people think uh, that music makes us want to move, is it's something about predictions. Predictions uh, both in terms of the musical structure or the rhythmic structure, uh, but also uh, predictions about movements of our body, which we use we think, to help make our predictions about timing more precise, uh, and also the auditory pre pre uh, predictions that we have help us make our movements more precise. So we can think about these predictions as occurring both in terms of what, what pitch is coming next, is a note coming next, but also uh, based on rhythm, as I just said. And these predictions that we have about what's coming next, of course, depend a lot on our experience. So the idea is that by exposure, passive exposure or active exposure to the music of our culture, we learn the predictions or the, uh, the types of rhythms, the types of note sequences that are likely to occur. And of course, this can also be affected by training if you have uh, musical training more generally, or sometimes even specialist training like jazz musicians versus uh, classical uh, musicians. And the bottom uh, or the, the basic idea is that there's a tension, a balance between predictions, what we think is going to happen and what actually happens. And these predictions and this discrepancy or this uh, tension between what we predict and the outcome that we get is what we think drives both pleasure and emotion. And I'll talk about, sorry, both pleasure and movement, and I'll talk about that a bit more. So first I'm going to give you a, a rapid tour 
of the regions that we're going to be thinking about in terms of these auditory and motor predictions. So the first one that we'll talk about is uh, are these auditory to motor processing strains both the dorsal and the ventral. These are based on, for those of you who are more familiar with the visual system, this is based on a very similar concept in the visual system of dorsal and ventral streams that are making predictions about what and about when. The other system that we're gonna talk uh, about are the basal ganglia to cortical systems. And I think probably most of you here know that the basal ganglia form loops or reciprocal connections. So basal ganglia to cortex, back to basal ganglia loops that are important for motor control. They're important for making higher order predictions about things like sequence, about chunking items together. And then finally, the ventral striatum is important for reward uh, prediction. Now, the other region that I'm not really going to talk about that much is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is one of my most favorite regions of the brain. If anybody wants to ask me about it later, please do. Uh, but we think that the cerebellum is also important in this context in terms of its uh, function uh, in model building and forward model uh, creation. So one of the first studies that where we began to investigate this idea of a link between sound and action that was uh, kind of obligatory automatic was in a study that was done by my student Joyce Chen, who's now at the University of Toronto. And what she did is uh, she uh, played people a set of musical rhythms, and I'm very sorry that you cannot hear these, uh, so they vary. So they vary in terms of their rhythmic complexity. And what they had to do in this task was in the first half of the trial, they hear the rhythm. And in the second half of the trial, they hear the rhythm again, and they have to tap along with it. And for those of you who can read music, you can see that there are some of these rhythms that are simpler. So the top one goes something like, right? So that's something that's not, uh, it has a beat to it. It's not that difficult to reproduce. And the other ones become progressively more difficult. So the idea is to really get people to engage in listening to and parsing the timing here. What we did in this study was to do that, and I'm sorry, I should, probably not a good way to explain it. We did, what we did first is, we had people simply listen to these rhythms. So in the second half of the study, they listened. On the second trial, they listened and tapped along. But in the first part of the study, they simply listened to those rhythms. We didn't tell them anything about tapping. We didn't tell them anything about what they were going to do, need to do. We just told them to listen carefully, and we were going to ask them about them later. And what we saw is that in that passive listening condition, we got regions of the brain that are typically engaged, uh, sorry, that are typically engaged when you tap along. So in the tap condition, when they had listened to this, they're listening again, they have to tap along. We get activity in the SMA, in premotor cortex, in the cerebellum, and in the basal ganglia, predominantly in the cutaneum. When they simply listen, we also get activity in premotor regions in the SMA and in the cerebellum. So this is telling us that when people are simply listening to a rhythm, they have no demand to do anything else, motor regions of the brain are engaged somewhat automatically. So this, many years later, led us to this question of groove, right? Because groove is a similar thing. When you listen to a piece of music that has an interesting, and I'll get to this beat to it, you have the sensation that you want to move along. So we thought this is related to this same uh, motor network, potentially, that was active in that previous study automatically. 
there's something about those auditory and motor temporal predictions that seems to be autonomic. So we decided to study this in the context of musical groove, which is defined as the pleasurable desire to move to music. So it's a two part kind of percept with both pleasure and wanting to move. Some of the first studies were done by uh, Peter Janata, and he played people all kinds of songs. Uh, some of them, I think, if you think about them, so like Lady Marmalade by uh, LaBelle or uh, Superstition by Stevie Wonder, these are what I always think of as, you know, uh, they clear the seats. If you're at a wedding and you hear one of these songs, everybody gets up from the table from young to old and starts dancing, right? And what he had people do was rate these combined uh, perceptions of wanting to move and pleasure. So we wanted to take this into a more uh, laboratory setting. Oh, sorry. Um, so taking this idea, um, let's go back and say that all of the studies I'm going to be talking about here were done in collaboration with my student Thomas Matthews, uh, with Maria Vitek, and with Peter Boost. Um, so what we decided we wanted to do uh, is uh, to jump off of Maria's work, which asked the question, well, what makes music groovy? Why are some of these songs, these ones that make us really want to move and others not so much? And what she showed in a study where she took uh, drum breaks from all kinds of uh, different styles uh, and types of music is that it's related to syncopation. So syncopation is when you have uh, changes in the predictability uh, of uh, the metrical pattern. So where you have uh, some places where you would expect a note to appear and you don't have one, or you have other places where you expect a silence and you have uh, a note that appears. So what she showed is that for both wanting to move and pleasure, the degree of syncopation is related to that perception, that rating, and it's related by a U-shaped function. So that for both wanting to move and pleasure, rhythms that are moderately syncopated are the ones that generate the highest ratings. So why might this be? The idea is that pleasure is related to some degree of surprise. You want, you have a prediction, you can make a prediction about what's gonna happen, but in syncopation, you get some surprises. If the rhythm is too complicated and you make a prediction and it always fails, or you can't make a prediction, there's no surprise, there's just kind of confusion. And the second idea is that wanting to move results from motor filling in, so that when you're trying to make that prediction and it's a little bit more complicated, what you do is you tap your motor system, which is very useful for timing events. And that's what creates that urge to move. And we can talk about this and more, this, these ideas more uh, later. So the idea is that syncopation at least makes music, or one of the things that makes music groovy. So what we decided to do is to create a set of stimuli, which I'm really sorry that you can't hear, um, that are based on um, Cuban clave rhythms. Uh, and they varied uh, in terms of their degree of syncopation uh, and also in terms of their harmonic complexity, because we wanted these to be a little bit more musically relevant. So we varied uh, how uh, predictable or unpredictable the harmonies were. Uh, so this clave rhythm sounds something like I'm a terrible, <laughs> but it's something like that. And what happens is in the low syncopation condition, it's fairly predictable. It's still got a degree of syncopation, but it's more predictable. It sounds then increasingly, and if you could hear this, you would actually hear even in these very reduced stimuli, it does actually give this sensation of wanting to move. And then you have a higher level condition where it's much more difficult to follow. It sounds like uh, some strange Aaron Copeland piece or something, or Stravinsky, where it's like all off beats. So what we did is uh, we had people, uh, sorry, so the idea is, and I'm sort of repeating what I said before, is that in the low syncopation condition, 
right? You have high prediction and high precision. You, you not only can predict, but your prediction is quite precise. So there's no error when you get the sound. There's no urge to move because I don't need to fill in. There's no learning because we think that part of what prediction about is about is learning and no pleasure. Similarly, in the high syncopation condition where it's really unpredictable, it's uninformative error. You get feedback, but you don't know what to do with it. You have difficulty incorporating it into a model of what's gonna come next. You don't generate this urge to move because you can't find the beat point. There's little learning, little pleasure. And finally, as we've said, in the medium syncopation condition, you have informative error. It's something that can help you learn, update your model. It creates the search to move, it creates learning, and it creates pleasure. So with that in hand, what we did is we played these to a very large group of people. Uh, and what we were able to show is that for both wanting to move and pleasure, we got this uh, inverted U-shape uh, uh, pattern where wanting to move was the highest for medium complexity and for, uh, and as was pleasure, sorry. And then the other thing that we saw is that this harmonic complexity also uh, affected or modulated uh, this groove response, where what we found is that for the high complexity, so this high harmonic complexity that sounds a bit dissonant, it dampened overall that groove response. So this is just to say that we know these stimuli and many of the stimuli that we use are very far from real music and that there are many things that can contribute to this sensation of groove, right? It's not just the temporal structure. It's also things like if you have uh, a chord progression that ends at a beat point, there's all kinds of things about uh, melodic and harmonic structure that can affect groove as well. But what we were curious about is how these, uh, the harmonic complexity and the rhythmic complexity interacted. There are many studies that show that harmonic complexity, so dissonance, affects uh, pleasure and regions of the brain that are important for pleasure. So what we wanted to look at was, well, how does how do those relate to this feeling of wanting to move? Are they relevant to this sensation of wanting to move? So we did a mediation analysis, and when we did this, we showed that harmonic complexity and rhythmic complexity both contribute to wanting to move. Uh, but then when we add in pleasure, what it looks like is that harmonic complexity really mediates wanting to move through the sensation of pleasure. So this is something that's quite interesting. It's saying that maybe these uh, percepts are a bit, uh, or these components of the total group percept are a bit separable. The pleasure may be more mediated by some of these harmonic factors, and this is something we're trying to chase down. So the other question that we asked ourselves in thinking about this group, right, is I told you that it's these medium syncopated rhythms uh, that generate this desire to move. But if you do uh, tests like that little uh, sets of rhythms that I showed you at the very beginning, the more complex the meter becomes, the less accurate people are in tapping along to it. So why do we want to move to rhythms that we are inaccurate at moving to? Why don't we all just want to go to that dance club, which is like four on the floor, you know, boom, boom, boom. So this was the question behind this study. It's a little bit uh, complicated or we, um, so if you have questions, you can, you can roll me back at the end. We did is here, we went back to these more, um, uh, um, naturalistic stimuli. So these were drum breaks that were drawn from a whole bunch of different pop songs. And there were a few that were created by the experimenter to fill out this low to high uh, syncopation range. Uh, and what we did is we had people listen to them and rate their groove, rate how much groove they felt that it had. 
and then we had them listen to it again and try to tap to the beat. And then we had them rate how easy was it for them to tap. So the concept was we wanted to get at the idea of why would a medium complexity, this more difficult rhythm, make you want to move? So do people perhaps have the perception when something is groovy that they're more accurate than they actually are? Maybe we like it because it makes us feel like we're on. So what we found, oh, thanks, I am playing those beautiful little drum breaks. Um, what we found is that as we would have expected, uh, we get that nice U-shaped function. So you get a peak in groove ratings for both musicians and non-musicians at a moderate level of syncopation. And we had seen this before, musicians tend to have a tight, uh, peakier peak than non-musicians, but they both show the same pattern. So this is good, the stimuli are working. Um, what we also showed is, as you might expect, tap accuracy uh, decreases as syncopation increases, and also tap precision decreases as syncopation increases. So this is this idea that more complex rhythms are simply harder to tap to. And if anybody wants to know about these measures, I can tell you about them. And what we also found is that top ratings uh, decrease as the syncopation index increases. So the more complicated they are, you perceive that you're less accurate. And in particular, in terms of top precision, it really uh, is a very strong relationship. So people really know that they're less precise when the syncopation is greater. But what was really interesting oops, to us is that if we looked at the relationship of the groove ratings, how groovy did I find it? At the top ratings, what we found is that the top ratings were more strongly related to the groove ratings than either the precision or the syncopation. So your top ratings and your groove ratings are highly linked to each other. And what we found is that that relationship follows this same U-shaped function so that the at that sweet spot of the syncopation index, this medium syncopation, people's groove ratings are more highly related uh, to their tap ratings. So people think they are more accurate at these high groove points, even though they're actually less accurate. And they know that they're less accurate, but they're feeling a precision. So I'll, this is, again, the kind of thing, maybe not everybody's fascinated by this, but what we think might be happening is that when you have this experience of groove, you have this moderate level of prediction. You, therefore, the and a moderate level of precision. So you have a moderate level of ability to predict, and your prediction is fuzzier. What we think this means is that your predicted beat point is actually in a wider window. So you can accept taps, your own taps, that fall in a broader window as being accurate. So we can talk about that more later, but the idea is that something about this medium level of prediction opens up your window of tolerance for what you think is accurate, and that allows you to have this feeling of precision with these moderately grouped. Okay, now, as the last step, what we wanted to look at is whether or not we can see uh, this uh, phenomenon of groove uh, in the brain. And what we know about rhythms and pleasure in the brain, right? Because we're talking about this idea of entraining to a rhythm or a beat and the concept of pleasure is that beat perception, and this is work from Jessica Gran, engages basal ganglia, but also this network that we had seen in that original listening study that includes the pleventary motor area, the premotor cortex, uh, and uh, again, the basal ganglia, and obviously the auditory cortex as well. 
And then we know uh, from the work uh, of Robert Satori and Valerie Salampour is that regions of the ventral striatum uh, are also engaged in reward in the context of music. And there are many studies that have followed on this, to, uh, some done by uh, people in this room. Um, so there's there's more to this story. And if you want to know more, you should ask Ernest and Lauda. But this gave us at least a place to begin, right? This is what we might expect. We might expect to get for these groovy rhythms, something that engages this motor network and something hopefully that engages this reward network. So what we did is we took only the uh, medium and high complexity uh, rhythms and we played them uh, to 29 musicians and 25 non-musicians uh, in the scanner. And we asked them to rate wanting to move in the scanner and pleasure outside the scanner. One of the problems with doing these kinds of ratings is they tend to contaminate each other, right? So you give something a rating of five for wanting to move and then you're asked about pleasure and you go, oh, five. Right, so we've always in these studies separated the ratings and here because we were very keen on seeing this uh, pleasure related response in the brain, we didn't want to bias the, the brain responses by asking about pleasure. So we asked about wanting to move in the scanner and we asked about pleasure outside the scanner. Um, I'll tell you right from the beginning that the differences between the musicians and the non musicians were pretty scant. Uh, so I won't talk about those here. What we can see here is the rating data, so wanting to move in pleasure, and you can see that as we expected, uh, wanting to move and pleasure are both higher for the medium complexity rhythms than for the high, uh, higher complexity rhythms. And in terms of pleasure, we also have an effective harmonic. Uh, so what we saw, if we look uh, at regions that are engaged by the high groove or the medium complexity rhythms more than the lower groove, uh, more complex rhythms, is this network including SMA, premotor cortex, also parietal, and the basal ganglia, uh, and this blob uh, in the basal ganglia really covered uh, everything. So uh, it included, um, Cutamen, globus pallidus, suncaudate, and reached into ventral striatum. But we did not feel comfortable saying, oh, this is engaging these reward networks. So what we decided to do uh, was to um, segment uh, the brains of our participants based on this atlas from Hammers that divides the uh, striatum into uh, the caudate, the cutamen, and the ventral striatum. So just as a reminder, caudate more motor. Uh, sorry, cutamen more motor, caudate more cognitive, higher level control, and ventral striatum more this reward circuit. What we saw is that if we look at uh, the relationship between activity uh, in the ventral striatum and the ratings uh, of wanting to move at pleasure, you can see that if you have pleasure alone, you have a strong relationship. If you have pleasure and you add wanting to move, you also have a strong relationship. You have wanting to move, it's a relation. And if you add pleasure here, then you abolish that. So there's some suggestion that this uh, ventral stradal uh, activity is more related to this feeling of pleasure. And for both the cutamen and caudate, uh, we have a clearer and opposite pattern where wanting to move is more strongly related uh, to activity in these regions. So uh, taken together, this is really, oh, I, it's really quite interesting. It's giving us this, <laughs> this sense that we have both of these motor and these reward systems and that there is some, uh, some suggestion that uh, there is uh, this reward network that's operating uh, in parallel. One of the things that's uh, quite nice, we have uh, a study that's uh, in preparation right now with people in Aarhus and Denmark uh, looking at uh, Parkinson's disease and these same group stimuli. And what you have here is uh, Parkinson's patients on, uh, with no medication, on medication, age match controls and young controls. 
And what you'll see here is for these stimuli, we get that U shaped function for both wanting to move and pleasure, which is present, although dampened a bit for wanting to move in the H match controls and really abolished in Parkinson's patients. So this is quite interesting. We're hoping this is going to come out soon. Um, so that's a little summary headline. Um, so now I'm going to quickly take you through a set of studies that we did on dance. I mean, maybe we don't necessarily think these are related, but I'm going to try to convince you that we should think about them together. Um, so we know from some studies that have been done uh, in older adults that dance can improve uh, gait and balance. These are dance interventions typically using Argentinian tango. Um, that have been done showing that Parkinson's patients improve their stability um, and uh, gait. Uh, and we also know that dance interventions can produce white matter changes in older adults. So in a dance intervention over, I think it was like 13 weeks, actually changed uh, white matter connectivity. Whether this is we could argue about maybe this is a result of the aerobic exercise component, but in that particular study, they compared to aerobic exercise. But we don't really know how dance might produce these effects, right? So there's obviously experience dependent plasticity. You, you do some kind of training, you get changes. Uh, it could be engagement of these sensory motor networks, right? So you are in re-engaging these networks. Maybe this is uh, facilitating it may be interactions with partners, right? So in the, uh, particularly in the uh, PD patients, they're always dancing with another person, right? So you have the fact that the other person, particularly in something like tango, which the partner dance pushes and pulls the individual. So they have something to respond to. Um, it may just be the rewarding nature of the activity, right? Dancing is more fun than just doing exercises. Maybe that's part of it. Um, so, I'm going to do the same little thing that I did before and say, well, what are the neural systems that we think might be engaged uh, by dance? We obviously have uh, the descending motor pathways and the uh, corpus callosum that coordinate the limbs, um, the two halves of the body. Um, we have my friends, the dorsal and ventral pathways, probably more predominantly that dorsal pathway. And we have our uh, basal ganglia circuits and the cerebellum. So what we did, um, and this is with uh, my late colleague, Krista Hyde, and with uh, her student, uh, Felicia Carpati, and my student, uh, Chiara Giacosa, uh, we looked at uh, brain structural correlates of long-term training. So we took people who were professional or quasi-professional dancers, and people who were trained musicians, and then also people who uh, had no dance or no uh, music experience. And we looked at uh, brain structure, and we looked at uh, different musical and uh, dance related tasks. So I'll just tell you very briefly that we uh, tried very, very, very carefully to match these people on all kinds of different variables, uh, age, sex distribution, body mass index. So uh, you might be aware dancers tend to be quite slim, like many other athletes, um, and body mass index uh, can have an effect on brain structure. Uh, so you see just changes in white matter in uh, people with uh, conditions like anorexia and even in some trained athletes who are well below typical body mass. Um, Years of dance training. So dancers have lots of dance training and little music training, and musicians have little music training and lots, uh, sorry, lots of little dance training and lots of music training and controls have neither. Um, and we also looked at level of education because people said to us, well, dancers, they don't go to university. They spent all their time dancing. So maybe <clears throat> we need to think about that. Um, so we controlled for level of education. And then what we did with them are three different tasks. We did a melody discrimination task, a sequen, a syllable sequence discrimination task, so a control where you hear, here you hear little melodies and you have to say same or different. Here you hear little robotic sounding sequences of syllables like ko, ru, ra, na, ku, and then you have to say is that the same or different than ko, ru, na, na, ku. 
We did that same rhythm synchronization task, and then we did uh, a dance task. I'm super sorry, but I can't show this to you because it's quite fun. So what we had is we had people do uh, the Dance Central uh, game from the Xbox Connect. Uh, this was the best time that my uh, undergraduate students ever had. They had to spend two weeks beating the entire game so that we <laughs> so that we could pick and choose the different levels of difficulty for the for the little uh, for the dance videos. So we had seven sequences of graded difficulty scored uh, and we used the game scoring itself. Uh, so they get stars and I don't know turnips and whatever. And so we used that scoring from the game. Uh, to score their performance. And if you could see this, you would see a beautiful dancer who's really got the groove, and then you would see somebody uh, who looks more like me. <laughs> um, so behaviorally, what we saw is exactly what we would have hoped for, which is uh, that uh, dancers in blue perform better, way better at the dance task than either the musicians or the controls. Musicians are still doing a bit better. On the rhythm task, uh, the dancers and the controls are both worse than the musicians. And uh, on the melody task, the musicians are performing uh, better than both the controls and the dancers. Um, and then the best thing of all is that on that sequence, uh, that syllable sequence task, they're all the same. So it's not just something, you know, people say, oh, musicians, they're just so smart, right? Because they can do music and they can go to university and whatever, right? And those poor dancers, you know. <laughs> so this is work that Felicia Carpati did looking at cortical thickness differences between uh, dancers and controls, musicians and controls, and dancers, musicians, and controls. And what we saw is really more overlap than difference. So uh, both the uh, dancers and musicians showed greater cortical thickness in the superior temporal gyrus, so regions that we would typically think about as being important for uh, higher order auditory processing. Um, and in addition, musicians uh, showed musicians showed additional changes, but there were no specific differences in cortical thickness in the dancers, which was a surprise to us. We were expecting to get differences in motor regions uh, as well. So then this is work that my student Chiara did where she looked at the connectivity. So this is looking at white matter specifically and not gray matter. And what she, uh, what she found is that there was evidence in the corpus callosum, cortical spinal tract and superior longitudinal fasciculus for reduced FA, so less coherent connections and greater dispersion. So I'm gonna show you just, this is corpus callosum, which links the hemispheres, sending motor pathways and superior longitudinal fasciculus. So this is somewhat puzzling, right? Because usually, when you are looking at an expert group compared to a less expert group, you're going to expect to get boosts, right? You would expect to say, oh, dancers, they've got greater connectivity, uh, greater density of fibers, uh, fatter fibers compared to these musicians in these pathways that are related to their expertise. But we, what we really seem to be seeing is that there's a relation that these uh, pathways are more broadly uh, dispersed. So they're covering a larger region uh, than they are in the musicians. And you can see here that this dispersion measure is also related to performance on that dance task. So this is consistent with the only other previous study that was done in dancers. Uh, and it's also consistent with other studies in athletes where you see this training effect does not have what you would expect, which is this strengthening of connectivity, but rather this index of greater, uh, potentially greater dispersion of connectivity. So what you can think about uh, is when you're looking at these diffusion measures, what you're measuring is the strength in a particular direction in the brain in a particular pathway. If you have many more fibers that are crossing 
and making perhaps more additional different connections, you may have more regions where fibers are crossing over, where they're overlapping with each other, which results in a measure that indicates greater dispersion. Now, this is uh, a, a hypothesis. It's very difficult to um, prove or disprove with these kinds of measures. There are other kinds of measures uh, for white matter um, integrity uh, that can overcome this, but with these measures, it's very difficult to, to be sure. Um, what we did try to do was to look at uh, specific connectivity from specific regions. So like the head, the leg, the trunk and the hand, we all know from that motor homunculus that the motor cortex uh, is divided up according to these different regions. Um, and what we were able to show is that musicians have evidence for stronger fiber coherence and are packing in the right hand and trunk uh, pathways. Uh, so controlling the left hand. So here we're getting that more expected expertise effect, right? Where you're showing stronger connectivity, greater fiber uh, integrity. And then the dancers, what we see is in a broader range of regions, so leg, trunk, hand, head, uh, we're getting uh, greater dispersion, again, predominantly in the right hemisphere. So controlling the left half, half of the body. There, we think that the reasons for this is well, partially because all of our uh, participants are right-handed, and the uh, one of the big motor uh, challenges of any kind of um, musical instrument expertise or dance is controlling that non-dominant half of the body. That may be why these are more uh, right hemisphere. Uh, uh, they are more predominant in the right hemisphere. So I think this tells me uh, that I am uh, running out of time. So in terms of the dance, I think we can see that long-term training has effects on pathways related to motor output, interhemispheric communication, and sensory motor integration. As I told you before, it's consistent with some other studies in athletes. Uh, and in, uh, also in those dance training studies in older adults, what they found was similarly greater dispersion after this uh, short-term intervention. Um, so I'll just say at the end, you know, maybe to try to bring it back to the kind of why should we care kind of question. So um, if we're thinking about implications, uh, if we think about the fact that a musical groove engages motor and reward networks, we know that reward drives plasticity, it drives engagement, uh, and maybe in the context of interventions, higher groove music uh, may promote uh, either basal ganglia or cortical activity. This could be helpful in intervention studies. Um, and in trained dancers, we certainly are seeing more widespread connections. And this, as I said, supports uh, what has been seen before in these intervention studies in aging. Uh, and maybe in Parkinson's disease, what's happening is you're uh, either supporting or bypassing uh, the deficient uh, basal ganglia. Well, I think I will stop now. And thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you. So we have a long time for discussion, I think. So let me be so you have a question. You scared me at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you can talk to the music. So. Yeah. Also, it's not that maybe there are maybe you can do it. Yeah, but I thought and if I switch back and forth and kind of faffing around. So, so there's no questions, yeah. Hi, first of all, I want to thank you for your talk. Um, I have more a curiosity question about sure. if there is uh if you think it will be a cultural effect on the groove. Yes, for sure. What we would imagine there have been some limited cross-cultural studies that uh, where my collaborator Maria Vitek uh, took uh, the more um, natural uh, stimuli, these drum breaks that are come from like Western groove music, 
um, to um, uh, and tested people in uh, Ghana. Uh, and they had very similar responses, but you can imagine, I still think that uh, Ghanaian or many of the African styles of music have, uh, you play with the syncopation in a very similar way to Western music. And as we know, Western music got a lot of things like that uh, clave rhythm from African uh, leaders, right? But perhaps if you take it to uh, cultures that have different structures, like uh, Indian music, which has these very long, um, more like rhythmic uh, figures, you might see a, a different effect. Um, I still think that these kinds of predictions are probably relevant because if you are an expert listener to Indian music, you're going to be able to pick up on this regularities, but I won't. So there are also some studies looking at differences between jazz musicians and uh, uh, classical music uh, players and jazz musicians pick up on different kinds of regularities. So absolutely, I think that there would be cultural differences. I think the basic underlying mechanism should be similar. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> now, this is obviously not my specialty. If anybody wants to see animals dancing, all you need to do is go on YouTube and you can see, uh, now that I forget his name, the cockatoo that dances to the Backstreet Boys. But, but your point is really well taken. So yes, obviously animals have some of these same neural circuits. What we think is key or crucial is the predictive component of it. So clearly animals make predictions about all kinds of events, but these kinds of hierarchically structured temporal predictions we don't think are so relevant. There's a current hypothesis that some types of animals may make similar predictions using a similar circuit in the basal ganglia. So animals uh, such as certain kinds of birds and some of the uh, pinnipeds like a uh, seals that imitate uh, vocal uh, sounds from their own uh, species and from others, that perhaps they'll have the same circuit. But that being said, I think the crucial element to think about is this hierarchical structure, right? So a beat is not necessarily present in the stimulus. It's a, it's a, a higher order uh, prediction that you extract from the low level structure. Animals can make predictions. So there uh, is a, uh, an investigator in uh, Mexico uh, who does some of these kinds of studies in uh, non-human primates. Uh, and what they see is that they can make, they can uh, learn intervals. So you, the monkey hears one, two, three. And after vast amounts of training, can emit one, two, three, but it can't generalize and it has only a limited ability to uh, shift uh, speed. So again, just go to YouTube and watch <laughs> pictures of two-year-olds going, yeah, right? You don't need to train the two-year-old to, to move to that uh, auditory stimulus. So, uh, monkeys may be a particular category because monkeys aren't very interested in sound in general, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence. I think Ruth was. Yes. 
So I think you could see from the Parkinson's patients, we're still working on this data. It doesn't look like there's a specific effect, right? For only for the movement part and not for the pleasure. We also know, right, that in Parkinson's disease, pleasure uh, response is dampened as well. Um, so I don't think that's uh, really unexpected. So yes, we are talking a lot with Giuseppe and with Ernest about this right now. So we have a study uh, where we're looking at people who are high and low in their responses uh, to music. So the particular aspects of the Barcelona uh, musical uh, reward questionnaire. So either the wanting to move or the more uh, emotional engagement part. And then in the same large sample, we're also looking at people who have, uh, who perform very poorly in terms of their um, pitch perception, and also in their ability to uh, and, uh, tap along with and to perceive the beat. So with the idea that if these components of the percept are really dissociable, you might be able to dissociate the effects, or maybe what it'll really turn out, which might be, in fact, the most parsimonious thinking, is that they are, are so entwined that you're not going to take apart, but it's a, yeah, it's a really interesting question. So the idea is that there is a very similar network, more weighted towards the right hemisphere for musical predictions, more weighted towards the left hemisphere for uh, language predictions. So I think the concepts of the role of the dorsal and ventral stream in music are tied very closely to some of the same concepts in language. So the idea being that like that ventral stream is important for, for what you would call syntactic, uh, grammatical, semantic predictions, and then the dorsal pathway being more important uh, for some of these like motor related uh, or perception production integration predictions. So it's quite, quite a similar concept. And we looked at uh, a little bit related. We compared uh, people with musical and with uh, bilingual experience and looked at the effects of uh, age of onset. So people who are early bilinguals show uh, changes in the connectivity uh, in the left hemisphere uh, in these auditory to motor pathways. And then the early trained musicians show more uh, changes in the right hemisphere. So it's a little bit of evidence, but I think the, a lot of the basics come from studies of language and thinking about language. It's, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of people who are thinking about this right now. 
um, you probably know um, how that slide that's about differences between basal ganglia, uh, temporal uh, encoding, uh, and cerebellar temporal encoding. So the idea generally is that the basal ganglia are really important for rhythmic or highly predictable uh, temporal conditions where you can make a, an easy and straightforward prediction about what's going to happen next. As you saw in one of the previous slides, um, you get basal ganglia engagement a lot of the time in these studies when you have uh, a uh, an isochronous rhythm, so something that's completely predictable versus like a scrambled rhythm. And uh, patients with Parkinson's disease show impairments on tapping to uh, a predictable isochronous mm -hmm. rhythm. And they also show perceptual deficits if you give them beep, 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 and they have to say what's coming next, they can't, they don't benefit from the predictability. Conversely, people with cerebellar damage uh, are more impaired when it comes to uh, using the, a previous interval, like a, a fixed interval or a, um, like an explicit interval to time a movement. So, to Try to make a long story short. What I think is happening here is that you need some of both. Cerebellum is also very much engaged when you're trying to correct or adjust uh, for errors that you're explicitly aware are occurring. So if you're engaging uh, in a task where you're trying to make a beat prediction, but you're having trouble doing it, or you're trying to uh, adjust your movement, or you're trying to adjust your prediction, though I think this is where the cerebellum is more important in this error monitoring, error adjustment, and forward model adjustment. So it would be more involved in uh, syncopated rhythms? What we have seen, Although we get sort of a, a bit of a flip in the groove studies, this is why I think it's it's difficult. So in some of those studies where we have a stepped progression, simple, medium, complex, if you do a regression, you get higher cerebellar engagement for more complex rhythms, which would fit with this concept of like correction and monitoring. Uh, but in the groove study, we get greater cerebellar engagement for the high groove for the uh, for the high groove medium complexity than for the lower groove higher complexity. So I think it's uh, yeah, there's sort of more to be to be done to be thought about. It may be part of this whole uh, prediction error updating network. Yeah, so there's lots of studies that have looked at this uh, melodic predictability. And to some degree, what we did here, you, obviously you can hear them, is it's the melodies don't vary. It's always that clave figure, but the harmonic complexity varies. So it essentially goes from uh, like unison, well, not quite unison, it's like a, I think it's, anyway, it's a, it's a nice chord, a more, uh, unusual chord and then uh, kind of a crazy chord. So it's more about dissonance in that context. So harmonic complexity has been shown to have the similar u shape function and many, many studies have looked at melodic predictability and combined uh, melodic and rhythmic uh, complexity in terms of um, information processing models. And you can see that uh, medium levels of information content tend to melodies that have medium information content tend to be really rated as more more pleasurable. 
So there's a lot of work. Joseph is doing a lot of things related to this. MS is doing more studies. Um, Yeah, so you're saying if uh, if you had the not the choice, but if you varied the complexity of the rhythm, it's not just how well would you perform right now, but would you learn better? Right. So we're looking at that. We're looking at rhythm learning in some of the studies uh, with Giuseppe, but what we're also looking at as well is this concept of um, whether or not this medium level of complexity would be related to motor learning. So there's a study that I did with Roberta Bianco um, where what she showed is that um, if you listen to a melody <laughs> that is of that moderate level of complexity, um, it can improve learning of you learn the only the last four notes and they are held constant in terms of their complexity or predictability. So it can have an effect on both your pleasure readings and your learning ability. And we're trying to do more stuff on that because I think it's a very interesting question, right? Because then it would fit also with the broader learning literature on the concept that a medium level of complexity is more appealing, it engages you, uh, you have more curiosity, there's more opportunity for reward for feedback, and that might be more, might stimulate better. So uh, I've been in part in parties in which the, maybe the playlist seems good, but people don't dance, and then you realize that maybe the speakers don't have bass. So there are like dimensions of the music, like bass or even the volume, that I think is that are very important for, for yeah. people to start dancing. So I, I wonder how these like. Mm, contribution that is not related to the structure of the, of the song, but more like maybe so I think that with a yes with yeah. a, a, a drum so, for example sure yeah people. no there's there's definitely uh, work out there that shows that uh, the bass the low frequencies carry uh, more information about the beat um, and that loudness is relevant uh, but I think you can just you can imagine listening to I don't know, construction noise, right? Uh, a jackhammer is maybe not a good example because it tends to be, but still you can imagine listening to some kind of noise that has both a lot of bass frequency uh, and high volume, but has no structure. And that's just horrible, right? And it's not, it doesn't. So I think you're absolutely right. There's many, many dimensions of music that contribute to the perceptive beat. It's not at all to reduce it to this temporal prediction, but uh, I mean, way back in like the 1800s, people looked at things like if you have a pitch jump, you get a perception that that note is a, a stronger beat. If you uh, have um, a volume change, a timbre change, all kinds of things. So it's not to deny that those aren't relevant, um, but one of the strongest determinants is the is the syncopation or the metrical structure. I think that we have to 
to end by so the so thank you very much again for coming and thank you very much for giving for the nice and inspiring talk <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.